Welcome to the Storyteller's Thread, a monthly podcast devoted to young adult literature and the art of storytelling. I'm your host, Sean Connors. On each episode, we invite an author for young adults to take us inside their work, and in doing so, to talk about their writing process, their inspiration for writing for young readers, and the general ins and outs of earning a living as a professional storyteller. So, whether you're a compulsive reader, an aspiring writer, a teacher or librarian, or simply a frustrated reader who's counting the hours until you get home and dive back into that novel that's waiting for you on your nightstand. This is the place for you. Hello everyone, it's April 1st, 2019. As I'm talking to you, I'm looking outside the window just opposite me, and I'm happy to report that the trees are all leaving, the grass is greening, and the tulips are in full bloom. Man, it feels so good, doesn't it, to see spring finally arrive? This month, I'm talking with Chris Crutcher, the author of 15 books for young adults. If you're familiar with Chris's work, then you know that sports feature very prominently in his stories, as do hardships that far too many young people are dealing with in our country. Over the course of his long and distinguished career, Chris's books have been a frequent target of censors, which is something that I talked with him about, and he's emerged as a strong advocate for the right of students to read. I'm really appreciative for his making time to talk with me, so Chris, if you're listening, a huge thank you. Before we dive into our conversation with Chris, I also want to thank those of you who've reached out to me via Twitter and email to let me know that you're enjoying this program. I've got to tell you, each month I send these episodes out into cyberspace, and I wonder what becomes of them. It's kind of like sending radio signals out into the deep recesses of space and then sitting around and hoping you're going to get a ping back. So the fact that people like you are making time to listen to this program means the world to me. Okay, with that said, let's get into my conversation with Chris Crutcher on this month's episode of The Storyteller's Thread. There's a moment in Chris Crutcher's young adult novel, Whale Talk, when the narrator's father, struggling to cope with a personal tragedy, identifies a problem that arises whenever well-meaning adults attempt to shelter young people from pain and trauma. I realized I had reached adulthood without even knowing what it is to be human, he tells his teenage son. Nobody ever told me how dangerous it is, how risky. In a writing career that has spanned 36 years and 15 books, Crutcher has earned a reputation for shining a light into the darker corners of human life and trusting his readers to deal with the pain and hurt he finds there. Growing up in a small, conservative community high in the Idaho Rockies, Crutcher spent his teenage years playing high school sports and working at his father's gas station. He later attended Eastern Washington State College where he swam competitively and earned a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and Sociology. After teaching in an alternative school in Oakland, California in the 1970s, Crutcher returned to the Pacific Northwest, settling in Spokane, Washington, where he earned a living as a family therapist specializing in child abuse and neglect. Collectively, these experiences have shaped his books, all of which examine the courage and resiliency that so many young people exhibit in the face of sexual abuse and domestic violence, abandonment and neglect, poverty and addiction. People magazine once described Crutcher as writing with heart-wrenching realism, and that may explain why his books, from Running Loose to Whale Talk to Staying Fat for Sarah Burns, are so frequently targeted by censors. Never one to shy away from a fight, Crutcher is an outspoken defender of intellectual freedom and an advocate for students' right to read. As he said in a blog post he wrote for the American Library Association's Office of Intellectual Freedom in 2016, I think the current political climate is reminding those of us who are willing to pay attention and remember how dangerous attempts at thoughtless mind control can be and how important the free exchange of ideas is to a true democracy. Crutcher is the recipient of the Allen Award, 
the NCTE Slate Intellectual Freedom Award, the Margaret A. Edwards Lifetime Achievement Award, and Writer Magazine's Writers Who Make a Difference Award. With a career like that, it was an honor for me to sit down with him to talk about the experiences that have shaped his books for young adults and the trust that he places in his readers to process the ruggedness of the stories that he tells. As anybody who's familiar with your work knows, sports feature very prominently in virtually all of the books that you've written. Can you talk about why you're compelled to write about sports and what they mean to you personally? To, you know, to a great degree, it's, it's a comfort zone. Um, the town I grew up in, and people that know anything about me know this, was a real small place. It was fewer than a thousand people up in the mountains. It was a logging town. There's very little to do. And high school sports is everything. And of course, back in those days, I mean, it's it's the early 60s. So what I really mean is high school boys sports and everything. And um, there were sports going on the entire year. You played football in the fall. You played basketball in the winter. You played uh, ran track in the springtime. We didn't have baseball because we were up so high that the snow hadn't melted off the baseball diamond. So baseball was kind of a summer thing. Um, Number one, you didn't have to be a good athlete to play. You just had, I mean, you could breathe, you could play. If you didn't show up on the first day of football your freshman year, they just came and got you. And, you know, and your parents let them in. So it's kind of the fabric of my high school time. And I was a serviceable football player. We played eight-man football. Because we, there were teams in the in the league that didn't have that didn't have eleven guys, and um, n- not much of a basketball player. I, I turned out to be one of my favorite sports, but I I was a young uh, high school kid. Like I graduated when I was seventeen, so there was some development <laughs> issues. Um, but you played. What I didn't realize was that I was actually a pretty good swimmer, and we didn't have a pool, so I had no idea about like competitive swimming. But we had this huge reservoir, which was about 20 miles long and then two and a half miles across, I think. So I swam there a lot. And when I got to college, just coincidentally, a a coach saw me and and that was kind of my, that my entire college athletic experience was swimming. And the reason it plays as as prominently in my books as, as it does, as sports do, is that it always bothered me that there was so much morality thrown into it. And there was religion. I mean, you know, back then, I mean, we, we pray before games and, um, you know, praise God for, you know, for winning. But nobody ever cursed him for losing, right? He just praised him for winning and wished he hadn't, you know, loved the other team when you lost. And there was that. And then there was this patriotic piece to it that I never understood. Because the, what I loved about sports was the challenge, you know, to be good enough to, to be there. And to be good enough to get on the field or onto the court, and it it seemed it always seemed to me like the coaches or the teachers or certainly the townspeople put too much on it. Now the town I grew up in was a real small town in Idaho. It's awfully conservative, so that that conservatism even back then it it was kind of it was wrapped in religion. It was wrapped in in this kind of patriotic um, blanket, and that never seemed right to me. I didn't I, I didn't like it then, and I really don't like it now. So. When I put sports into my into my stories, um, my vision of what they should be, there's a purity to athletics that I love. I mean, I still go out to the pool and, and swim two miles a day, and I do it in repeats. And there's a feel to just taking yourself out there and pushing yourself as, you know, as, as hard as you can go. And when I'm done with it, I feel accomplished. Uh, I'm calm. I, I focus better, certainly focus better on my writing. So there's something about, there's a, there's a, what I consider a congruence between your, your mind and your body, that, that idea that, that if you concentrate hard enough, you push yourself hard enough, you know, whatever it is that that task takes is there's not a lot of difference to me between pushing myself physically and pushing myself mentally, I guess, mentally or psychologically, I guess, um, when I'm, when I'm writing. And I, and I'm, I was all, all my life and I didn't know this growing up. I was, I was, uh, ADHD all over the place and I still am and so concentration is much harder for me than pushing myself physically but part of what I've learned you know with pushing my physical self is that you kind of you have to you have to block everything out 
but the thing that you need. And and so when I'm writing a story, one of the things that a lot of people say about my writing is that, man, it gets pretty intense in there. You know, you're t- writing about kids with some really ugly problems and things like that. You know, those problems are problems that I worked with working full time in the mental health world. And um, the intensity is what keeps me writing. I, I can't write a, a long, slow story because I, I'll lose the intensity. And the intensity that I feel when I'm doing something physical and the intensity that I feel when I really get in on a roll writing are very much the same. So I, I think one of the things that happens in stories for me is that when I, when I put my character into an athletic, a challenging, a physically challenging situation, um, it makes it more real to me. And the way they respond, and sometimes they surprise me, but the way they respond makes them makes them seem like more than a character. And the further I get into the story, the you know, the more I connect to them. You talked about your background a little bit growing up in Cascade. Can you describe Cascade as you remember it growing up? When I was growing up, it was a it was a lumber town, and um, there was there were two major logging towns. One was Boise Cascade. And the other was a outfit run by J.I. Morgan. And then a, a whole bunch of uh, Jippo loggers that were, you know, that worked for those guys that signed on with them when they get a big, when they get a big project going on. And I worked in my dad's service station. We were the only service station in town, number one, that sold diesel. So we sold diesel to the loggers. And we were the only one that fixed truck tires. And so I, I knew all those guys. I heard their stories over and over and over again. And they were tough guys. I would I would guess that the average education was probably tenth grade. You know, we had so many people who had who dropped out. You know, you could do that then. You drop out when you're 16, go to work in the sawmill, or go to work out in the woods. Um, there's not much going on. It's just one main street, and it's main street's the only paved street in town. Everything else is dirt, and in the spring it's mud. And uh, you knew everybody by name. Um, almost nothing happened that everybody didn't learn about real quick. You know, you could always get help, but you would always get a lot of derision along with the help. <laughs> and um, for me, it was like I, I wasn't a, I wasn't a tough guy at all. I didn't hunt. I didn't have the heart to hunt. And um, I mean, I played sports hard and I was funny and I, I was popular because I was funny. And um, and I, I I moved probably more easily between groups than a lot of people did, because my dad had a rule that we we closed our service station one hour after every other business in town closed. Wow. So there was one hour and I always worked the night shift. So in the summertime, particularly and on the weekends and things, there was one hour every night when there was no place to go in town, but Morrison Crutcher's Philip 66 station. And so I would be hanging out with people that probably I wouldn't have been hanging out with a lot and hearing their stories and starting to realize that, you know, the, the kids in school that weren't popular got a lot fewer second chances in the office than we got. And, and I heard a lot of the stories that, you know, that I didn't recognize them then, I, th- I think, but I heard a lot of these kinds of stories that I heard later when I was working in abuse and neglect. There were some tough parents in that town. In your autobiography, King of the Mild Frontier, you describe Cascade, and I'm going to quote you here, as having offered precious few opportunities to become. Can you talk about what you mean by that? Yeah, experientially, your, your jobs are around there. If you wanted to stay around, we're going to be at, at the sawmill or out in the woods. Or if you were a person who, you know, if you ran a business like my dad did, um, that that kind of thing. There's no internet. Um, when I was younger, you got your you got your news at the movie theater. <laughs> you know, the world ends on Wednesday, and you don't know it till a Friday. <laughs> and, and believe me, you wouldn't have known. So you you didn't. Number one, you didn't have a sense of what was possible. You didn't know almost any of the opportunities that were available to you like jobs when you, you know, what, what, first of all, whether to go to college. And I was lucky to have a dad who said, that is not a question we ask around here. We ask where, and that was not true for a whole lot of, you know, kids that I grew up with. Um, when I went to school, I thought I was going big time when I went to Eastern Washington, it was a state college then it's a university. Now there were like maybe 4,000 kids at Eastern Washington. And it was a, I mean, it was, it was basically a war college. It was one of the last, I didn't know this when I enrolled because I wasn't, I didn't read the catalog, but it was, it was one of the last state colleges in the country to require two years of uh, ROTC. And then you had the choice of going into the advanced program and they would pay for your education and you paid, paid them back by going to Vietnam. So it was a really conservative, it was a really conservative place. And I remember going into the high, my high school library and looking at the college catalogs 
and I'll I'll bet the just looking at the catalogs in the in the bookshelf, I'll, be, I'll bet there wasn't two feet of them. You know, there was like the University of Idaho. You didn't know. You had no idea what was, what was possible. And I wasn't really curious about that because um, just the idea of, of leaving that place, I knew I was leaving. I knew I, I wanted to, but it also terrified me, you know, because I didn't know I, I, was, a, I was not a really good student. I wrote the ADD, the ADHD wasn't it it wasn't there was not no such diagnosis i don't even think then but um it had me thinking that i really wasn't very bright and i had zero study study skills so when i looked at it and i go back and and look at my friends i think you know we were considered one of the most successful schools in our league but that's mostly because we had really good athletics but i look kind of four years ahead of me and four years behind me and i re- i know very very few that went to a, a university more major than the University of Idaho. I mean, I, th- I remember one of the guys in our class who was a brilliant kid went to Oregon State, and it was like, you know, what spaceship do you get on to go there? <laughs> you know. So it was just this kind of this sense of um, I, I see this now sometimes in, in in really small schools. There's a tendency to just think that you're when when your environment isn't big enough that maybe you're not big enough either. Hmm. And I think that was that was what, when I said that in the, in the autobiography. That's what I meant. I think there were um, we had some brilliant kids. You know, I mean, statistically you have to, but I, I think um, you just got a real slow start. And there are some who have done really well, but they had to go. They had to go find out about those opportunities on their own and later. You mentioned that you went to Eastern Washington, and I know that you swam there, and you earned a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and Sociology, I believe. I did. And then later, you taught for a while, I think in the Bay Area. Right. And then transitioned to work as a child and family therapist. What prompted you to make that career change? Almost everything I did after I got out of college was due to indecision. (laughs) (laughs) I graduated graduated in 68 with with a BA in Psych and Social. But um, I took a year off with, with my roommate, who was also a friend of mine in, in high school. Uh, he's a uh, Japanese kid named Ron Nakatani. We're still really good friends. And we traveled around the country and worked. And uh, we, I think we, we ended up for, I think, three or four months pouring pre-stressed concrete bridge beams in Dallas, Texas for $2.13 an hour. And when we had saved $1,000 a piece, we went to Hawaii until we didn't have that money anymore. And, but I came back and, and I, I thought, you know, there's no way in the world I'm like some guy who's going to sit in, a, in an office and listen to people's problems. And I, I just didn't know what to do. And I did. I, I went back to school and got an education degree for the absolutely worst reason you can do that, because I didn't know what else to do. And, of course, I'm the front end of the baby boomers, so I graduated, or when I got my teaching certificate, you know, any job that you applied for, there were 25 other people applying for the job and 24 more qualified than me. But, but it was kind of the front end of this idea about alternative education. And there was a some title money and a program down in the Tri-Cities in Washington to start this kind of a dropout school for high school kids. And... They hired me to do it because I had the psych major and because I was brand new and they didn't have to pay me very much money and I don't think they thought it was going to work anyway. And it actually, it was it was the best job that I could get because it was you you, you got the school that it formed two or three students at a time because you took them as they were being thrown out and it gave me time to you know sit down and say, hey buddy, we got to figure out some way to get you out of here and you're going to have to tell me what works for you and what doesn't. And um, I did that for about a year and a half. The title money dried up, and I went into the I went into the high school in Kennewick, Washington, and taught there for a year. And um, I I didn't think I was very good at it. I thought I, I, I was a lot of fun, <laughs> and I could I could hold your attention, but I you know I wasn't I wasn't passionate, and it was real hard to keep my mind on it. And so I. I went down to the Bay Area, just packed up this little VW Bug. I have no idea how that how that car made it down to the Bay Area, but I had a friend down there, and um, alternative schools were all over the place. I mean, it was the early '70s, Bay Area, California. You couldn't open your car door without hitting somebody that was starting an alternative school, and uh, 
so I, I ended up going into this K, this K through 12 school and it was all kids that weren't making it in the public schools. When I went out there, they hired me as a teacher's aide in the elementary school. And I was teaching, I was teaching math and science and some social studies to first through sixth graders. And after, I think it was after the third year, we were having, we we're having a meeting. We'd gotten a hold of an old, uh, an old grade school that had been condemned. It was, it was built before there were earthquake standards. And so we had this place and it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful building, a little deck outside and we we're out on having our teachers meeting and polishing off quite a few beers. And I had to go to the bathroom. When I came back, I was the director. <laughs> I said, you don't want to, you sh I shouldn't have left. Yeah. <laughs> so I did that for another seven years. And it was so coincidental, but it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me. Because, you know, these were kids that all the good stuff had been tried. And it, I, I had the experience of saying, you know, I got to, if I got a kid that's particularly tough, I got to sit down with that kid and say, if we don't get you through this, we both fail. You, you got, and you're going to have to tell me how to do it. And they would every time they would tell you and i was i was good with the teachers i was able to you know i was able to sit down with them and and you know just hammer out individual uh courses and things for these kids and there were about 125 kids in school so it was it was small you knew them all but it, it was still a little difficult to manage when they're all you know a lot of troublemakers and stuff and it, it had the intensity. Number one, I, I was at the point that I started being, uh, d directing. I didn't have to worry about content. I had to worry about relationship. And I was a whole lot better at that. And um, it absolutely prepared me when I went back up or came back up here to the Northwest and started working with the Child Abuse and Neglect Project. How did it prepare you? I mean, I got those kids. You couldn't, it was hard to surprise me. And, I, you know, I look at that and I think at the alternative school, we had way more leeway to try things just, just because, you know, nobody cared uh, um, outside of outside of us. And um, but it really taught me a lot about number one, it taught me a lot. I, I, I probably didn't have the vocabulary for it, but it taught me a lot about how different kids learn different ways. Um, you'd see how certain kids, I mean, you look at these kids and you think this kid is brilliant. And, you know, God, if you can just get that going another direction, we got a shot. So when did you first begin to think that you might be interested in writing fiction? When I was working in the alternative school, I'd been a, a good friend of Terry Davis, who, was, who wrote Vision Quest, which is a, about a high school wrestler. And I'd known Terry, and we went to college together, and I used to, I used to kind of edit for realism for him when he was writing. And I could figure out structure. I, I, you can't give me, if you tell me how to do something, there's a real good chance I won't do it. But if I get involved in it and see it, see it, how it works from the inside, I've got a pretty good shot. And so I'd be reading these chapters of Vision Quest, and I go back and I, you know, the, I love this, I love this, I really love this character. This doesn't, this isn't real, you know. And then he would go back and fix it. And when he got finished, I thought, I thought, God, it, you know, he didn't do anything I couldn't do if I, if I'm willing to do the rewrites. And I had some stories, you know, I had stories, I had characters, I had, God, guys I grew up with. And, you know, my, I mean, my dad was a bomber pilot in World War II. He's a, flew a B-17. By the time he was the same age I was when I graduated from college, he had flown 35 missions over Germany. So I had, I knew a lot of really intense stories. And, and I knew, I, I had learned by that time that intensity was my deal. It was my friend. So, um, I'm, when I'm down there in this, I'm down there in this alternative school. I thought, God, these these kids. There are kids here who stand up under pressure that would just crush me. But you know, I mean, they they figure out how to survive. They just keep getting up. And they keep getting up. And so my idea of what a you know a good protagonist was, a, a good hero was, was changing. And I thought, God, I've always been able to tell good stories, and I've always I think in stories if I could just calm myself down enough, but at this alternative school, I mean, I get called at 11 o'clock at night by the Sonitrol people telling me that somebody had broken into the school. There's nothing in there, but I'd have to go out, you know, the cops and close it down and do all that. So I, it, it was really hard to find any time 
to just sit down and write because the intensity was outside. When I got finished, I had about, I think, four months or five months between the time that I was done there and I was coming back up here. I had nothing to do. And I thought, you know, I've been talking about writing. I've been wanting to write. I'm going to give this a shot. And I sat down. I had this story. It was running loose. It was a story about a racist. In, in real life, he was a racist basketball coach. So I turned him into a football coach for the story. And uh, I just sat down and wrote it. And I was so involved in it. I mean, I, I probably wrote more hours per day on that first book than I've ever done since. And then, God, you know, you think, this is great, but, you know, who's going to publish a book by somebody who read one book in high school? And um, I had Davis read it. And he was a guy that would never tell you that it was, you know, that it was junk. But he called me at two in the morning. He had moved, he, he had moved back up to the Northwest and I sent it up to him. And he called me at two in the morning. So I knew I'd kept him awake with the story. And he said, you got to send this into my agent. And God, by the end of the week, I had an agent. That's actually a good stepping off point. I want to talk about your writing. Throughout your career, you've used your books as a vehicle to explore difficult social problems. Your characters struggle with physical and sexual abuse, poverty and racism, domestic violence and addiction. As a writer, what motivates you to shine a light into those darker corners of human life? Well, I think it was when I, I got up to the Northwest and I, I really didn't know what I w wanted to do. I was in my 30s. I was probably 35. I had a much better sense of myself, I think, and my kind of relation to, um, to people in trouble. And the one thing that I learned working down at the alternative school was there's no us and them. There's just us. <laughs> I never had a client or a student that wasn't like me in some way. And when I started working with these, with these families, and one of the things that happened when you work with a family is, is that you, you, we, we did a lot of stuff in teams. And so my expertise was like adolescents and adults. So I was getting a lot of the abusers and the people who were turning into abusers and kids were getting in trouble. But I, I worked with this fabulous play therapist that worked with little kids and did a whole lot of did a lot of uh, kind of replay therapy with them kids kids playing th playing out their trauma, and then we did a lot of stuff where we we do these things separately and then we bring them all together so that you get a look at the whole family, and as I started seeing that, I mean you start seeing why things happen, and I thought some of this stuff is it's it's right in front of us all the time. And we'll do whatever we can to not take a look at it. And I thought, you know, that that's where I needed to start telling my stories. If I if I if I can shine a light on it and people can experience it without having to talk about their own lives. I looked at the kids that were in my the teenagers, particularly who were in my, on my caseload. And, you know, they were they were a lot of more outsiders. Some, some of them weren't so much, but none of them were going to go to school and tell their story. You know, this is way too dangerous. And their behavior was always, you know, it, it, it's like if I'll, I will show you my rage long before I'll show you my fear. Hmm. So, you know, teachers were seeing kids they really didn't like because the kid, you know, the, the kid is doing whatever he can to keep anybody from seeing what their real life is like and what they really feel like. But when you're in, you know, God, kids don't recognize this so much, but you get in a safe place where there's a therapist in a room. It's just you and the therapist and you can say anything you want and you can use any language you want. And he promises not to tell and he doesn't, man, they will tell you anything after, once you get that, once you get that uh, relationship established. And so one of the things that I started thinking, I thought, you know, this is a real hard job. This child abuse and neglect therapy stuff, you know, it's a real hard job. It's nowhere near as hard as being a teacher because if you're a teacher, you get those same kids and you get a whole bunch of them. You know, you got to do some, some really bad things have to happen to you before you get to see a therapist. Everybody gets to see a teacher. And when I start talking to these kids and, you know, I'd say, what's your favorite class? They never tell me your favorite class. They tell me your favorite teacher. And you, you start to realize that they go around. If they're going to get any adult support, they're going to find that one person in the school or two people in the school that can see them, you know, through their stuff. A lot of times it's going to be an English teacher because English literature, that's where the stories are. And you can, you know, you get, you get the right stories. I can talk about kids who have lives like mine as long as I don't have to talk about mine. And so there was this piece where I thought, this is a place where kids in particular, teenagers, can understand each other 
just by talking about stories. If you get these stories into, you know, into classrooms, if you get these stories someplace where there's more than one kid reading it and a conversation starts. And I realized really early that whatever, you know, whatever I wrote, what it, what it meant, what I thought it meant didn't matter at all. It doesn't matter. It does not matter one bit. It matters what it means to the kid. And, you know, a lot of times a book is better than it ever had a right to be because of the, the history the reader brings. And so kids and parents, wherever they, they start doing it, you know, they started doing these things where you do, do an all community read or something like that. And God, listening to parents and kids or kids and other kids, which is more likely you know, doing school visits and things like that, standing up for the character they liked or telling you why the character act, you know, acts like that, that kind of thing. And you thought there's probably as good a piece of therapy in this story as there ever was in my office, and the kid gets to decide. There's such safety in it. And you'd see it happen, then, you know, and then you start getting emails, right? Or you go to a school, and kids that no teachers ever thought wanted to write or tell stories or something slip you a story or a poem. Or they will follow you around and get you alone to tell you some secret. Because you're like you are when you're a therapist. You're not going to tell anybody, and you're out of here tomorrow. And so you would you start seeing the power of their responses to, you know, Chinese handcuffs or or uh, Sarah Burns, you know, whale talk. And what was funny about it was they would tell you a story that was completely different, of course, from the one that the one that you wrote. But it was God. This is why I like you know this is this is why I feel like Sarah Burns. You know, well they weren't burned, but it was like the scars on the inside felt just like you know hurt just as much as the scars on the outside and then and then you know the more i heard it the more i just kind of went down that same path i want to go back to your autobiography for a moment because there's a connection here in it you attribute your motivation to represent your characters lives as honestly as possible to an encounter that you had with a young biracial girl that you met not long after you began working as a family therapist would you mind telling that story for people who are listening to the podcast yeah, it's a story that um, ended up in actually fairly close to, to the real thing in, in, in Whale Talk. And it's one of the few times, this was a kid who, I, I knew this kid when she was five. That's when we were working with her and her family. But when she was 16, um, she pushed me to put her life in a story. <laughs> and she signed papers and had her and had her adopted parents sign papers to, so she could do it. But the, the story was, I had just come back up here. And I was, I'd, I'd been 10 years down in Oakland and Oakland, you know, is as diverse, as ethnically diverse as any place in the country. And I was back up in the Northwest and it's the inner, it's the inland Northwest. It's not Seattle. It's over by the Idaho border and it's pretty white. And it was really white then. And there was one, we had a classroom of Head Start kids. So five years and under, and they were, um, all kids who had either been in foster care and were trying to transition back home or were still in foster care. And the program that we were working in was one where the Head Start program and the mental health center put, put our resources together. So I went out there with this one group as a therapist for the parents. And then there was this play therapist who worked with the kids. And Head Start requires parents to participate too. So you've got, them, you've got everybody out there. And so I would be doing um, relationship groups and, and uh, domestic violence groups and things like that with the parents and also working with the kids. But as I'm going out there, I'm thinking, you know, I, I know that I'm going to be doing groups and things with the parents, but I'm going to be out there for like four hours a day. And so I'm going to be working with these kids. And I didn't have any idea what to do. With, you know, I didn't know how to do play therapy or anything like that. And what the play therapist said to me when she said, look, these kids, if they've been physically abused, statistically, it was probably a guy. So when you go in there, they're not going to know who you are. And there will be kids who approach you and kids who just want to stay away from you. So you just let them come to you. Don't judge and don't scold. When you don't know what to do, don't do anything. So I walk in the room this first day and this little girl, there's 17 kids. 16 kids are white and one little girl's mixed race. Now nobody knows who her dad is because her dad's actually uh, a black airman out at the Air Force Base. But he didn't even know he had a daughter. And mom had had a fairly short relationship with him and then gotten with this just viciously racist carnival worker guy. And this guy hated this little girl. He didn't want her in his family. He wanted to be with mom, but he didn't want this kid. So he just, I mean, he treated her like 
you know, like the racist he was. And the N-word came out of his mouth like a and and uh, he was on her all the time. And anything that happened, anything that happened was her fault. Well, they had two kids real quick together. And, and so she had these two little half-brothers that were privileged in that family. I mean, they ate before she ate, and she ate what was left over. And they played with the toys till they were broken, and she played with broken toys. And that was just it. But you'd, go, you'd, you'd walk in there to, into the room, and you, you couldn't see any of that on her face. I mean, she just was one of those. She was this real kinetic kid, and she was one of those kids that everybody's just kind of drawn to. Almost always had a smile on her face. A little bit mischievous, but just just a cool kid. But I'm, when I first when I first see her, I mean, I, I don't have much of her history at all, but I, I first see her, she puts her stuff away. And she goes over to the sink, and she, there's a brush over there and some soap, and she soaps up the brush, and she starts like, scrubbing on her arm really hard. with a, And it's a stiff brush. It looks like it hurts. And I go to the play therapist, and I say, God, you know, what's she doing? And uh, she says, well, she thinks that she can scrub the color off that her stepdad will love her. And I said, um, why don't somebody tell her her stepdad's a jerk and she's cool and let's get on with this. And she said, because she doesn't go home with you. If she goes home, she goes home with him. And um, what she's doing right now is showing us what her life is like. And when we're done with this, she'll know she's cool and he's the jerk. But we have to get there and we have to get there basically through her perspective. Well, then I see him go into the playroom. And, and what the play therapist did was... We had all these kids, and some of them had similar problems, so a lot of times she'd take two or three of them. But in this particular case, it was just with the one little girl, and there was a separate room that just had every toy you can imagine. And little girl would walk around the, around the playroom, ignore the trucks and cars and Legos and blocks and all that, just pick up dolls. And she'd get this armload of dolls, and there was a, there was a big, it was kind of a half appliance box, I think an old refrigerator box or something. And she'd dump the dolls into the box. And then she'd go down on her knees and she'd close her eyes and reach into the box and pull out a doll. If it's a light-colored doll, she treats it like her little brothers get treated. She rocks it and she sings to it. She gives it a little bottle and, and puts it in the crib. If it's a darker-colored doll, she treats it like she gets treated. She screams at it. She calls it names. She slaps it. She throws it across the room. And when she's done, I mean, she's just in a heap. She's sweating. And the play therapist is just right there with her. When the little girl's mad, she's mad right with her. When the little girl's broken and sad, she's broken and sad right with her, just giving her that congruence. So I'm watching that, and I'm thinking, you know, whoa, what a life. What a way to have to look at the world, right? Well, when I, when I first go in, like I said, I don't, I don't know any of this. And she, when I walk in the room, she's over there scrubbing her arm. And, and when she notices me, finally, she dries her arm off, and she walks over. And she just plants herself in front of me. And I don't know what she's doing. We're looking at each other. So I try to step around her. And she just goes whatever way I go, she goes. She's not going to let me get around. And so we just stand there smiling at each other. And then she just puts her arms up and, like, pick me up. So I pick her up. And I, it's like I've got her kind of extended out there, eye level. She's got this great big smile on her face. And she says, fuck her, bitch. And I kind of went, Whoa. And I was smart enough to remember, she said, when you don't know what to do, don't do anything. And actually, it sounded kind of funny coming out of a five-year-old kid, and I laughed. And when I laughed, she, she kind of threw her arms around my neck and started giggling. Well, just after that, I've got groups. And I've got her mom and her stepdad and some other, the other parents in the groups. And these two, this mom and the stepdad, boy, they were, I mean, you bring up any issue. And the accusations start flying at each other and the name calling and it just gets nasty quick. And when they get really, really ticked off, guess which two words come up? You go, oh, I get it. You know, she just threw them together. She didn't have any idea what they meant. They were just, it was danger. Well, yeah. And play therapist says, look, this is the smartest kid in the room. She said, she lives in the eye of the hurricane. She said, you walked into the room. She says, she doesn't know you. And you watch her anytime, anytime a new adult comes in the room, particularly if it's a guy, she'll go over and run something up the flagpole because she's got to know if you're safe. She said, if you'd gotten mad at her, if you'd have scolded her, told her she couldn't talk like that, she would have pushed away and got down and, and you'd be furniture. She wouldn't engage with you in any way. She says, you can't take away a kid's language and, and means of expression until you've got something better to give them and you don't. Hmm. 
So we're looking for the right foster place and we'd get her, you know, home finders were doing, they were getting, you know, they knew she was a pretty tough kid to, to, to keep. So they were being real careful, but we had a, a period in there where she had six foster homes in three months. She'd go to the foster home and boy, for a week, she just was stellar. And then she started getting nervous because every time she'd been in foster care before, they gave her away. So she start testing them out like she did me, and they'd start the discipline, and they're sending her back two weeks into it, and she's headed back for social services with this nasty little suitcase she had. So we're thinking there's one foster home that we know would work. It's a it's a mixed race home already, so you don't have to go through all the the extra social service stuff. And I knew the dad. We used to play some basketball together, and he was dying to get his hands on this kid, but they were always full. So leaving a game one day and I said, man, if you're ever, I, I don't care if it's midnight, if you guys get an opening, call me. And it's not midnight, but it's dinner time and I'm just sitting down to eat and the phone rings and it's him. And he says, Chris, we just sent a kid home. If you can get her out here tonight, we'll do the paperwork. We'll get it started. But if you wait till tomorrow, they're going to put another kid in here. Man, I call the play therapist up. I said, go get her. Come get me. We are going out there. Play therapist jumps in her car, goes, gets the little girl. We're riding out to the foster home. And this kid is, boy, she, that big smile just is gone. She's, she's got her best clothes on. She's sitting in the front seat. She's, in, she's riding shotgun and I'm in the back. She's got a little bow in her hair. She's got her best clothes on and she's just petrified. She's just sitting there like a, like a little soldier. And the closer we get to the foster home, she starts rocking like little kids do. And by the time we get out there, She's she's leaned over and she's chewing on the armrest. You their little toothprints in the armrest. So we pull around behind the house and it's one of those. It's kind of a big U-shaped ranch house and they still had a couple of other foster kids and they had two teenage sons of their own. We drive in, we drive around, come in in the back. Place is all lit up. It just looks warm from the outside. We get out of the car and I think this is the thing I remember more than anything. She gets out of the car and she looks at this house and she stands there a second. She's big sigh. She just goes. <sighs> I don't know how much longer I can do this. So we go in. These foster parents are so cool. They've got, you, you go in the back door, so you're walking into this great big kitchen. Other foster kids are there, younger kids, mom and dad, the older boys. The place is lit up. She walk in the room. They start clapping. And while we were going to get her, foster dad goes out to McDonald's and gets happy meals. She walks in there. You can see him. She looks at him out of the corner of her eye, but she doesn't even pretend like she wants one. She just walks kind of the middle of the kitchen, She's just standing there. She can't knock anything over. She's just going to stand there and be good. Foster dad is this really funny guy, and he starts kind of messing with her a little bit, trying to tease her to get her to loosen up, and she's not going to have it, any of it. She's just standing there. So he gets the Happy Meals out. He opens them up, and he hands out French fries to everybody. And she takes that little McDonald's envelope, and she's standing there, one French fry at a time. I mean, she's being so careful, she's not even spilling salt. And you know what's going to happen. You know, she's five years old and she's scared and she drops the fries. And they just spill out over the floor and she just panics. Like, give me one more chance. Please give me one more chance. I promise I'll never do that again. I can clean this up. I'll, I'll get it all cleaned up. Actually, I don't even like French fries. And I'm over here going, God, when does this kid get a break? But this foster dad is so quick and he's so smart. And he sees those French fries on the floor and he's, got his french fries in his hand and he just dumps them and he goes down on his hands and knees and he says he says we used to eat them down here all the time that's how they taste best thanks for reminding me and she looks at him like he's totally out of his mind and his two sons are over there and they're going that's cool so they dump theirs i'm over there i figure i gotta get in on this so i dump mine we're not even picking them up off the floor we're eating them off the floor which is fairly disgusting but she thinks it's funny and the tension just goes out all of a sudden, everything's funny. Five minutes later, the little kids are in the bedroom playing. She's in there with them. We're getting ready to leave because they don't need us anymore. And we're walking out, and I'm thinking, I'll bet I don't ever see this kid again. They're gonna, you know, they're gonna run this. They don't need us. They they're way better at this than we are. And I just like to know how one of these things turns out once in a while. But I get lucky because 11 years later, I get up in the morning and I go out on a run, and for some reason, I'm running in a neighborhood I don't usually run in. And I see this high school girl walking down toward the bus stop, and it's her. And I see her, and she's got a little band instrument, and she's walking toward the bus. And I start to yell at her, and then I think, you know, I come out of a pretty hard time in her life. Maybe we ought to just let this ride. But she sees me and recognized me from 11 years ago. 
and yell my name. I mean, she's waking the neighbors up. So I run over there and we're walking to the bus together and she starts talking to me like we've been, you know, like we've been talking for the last 11 years. So the bus is coming and we're getting, you know, I'm getting ready to ride. I'm feeling really grateful. As I start to run off, she says, hey, wait a minute. He said, she said, you've been writing books. And I said, how did you know that? She said, our teacher made us read one of them. So she said, listen, like if you ever wanted to stick my life in a book, go ahead and do it. And I said, well, actually, your life's a little bit confidential because she said, I'll sign papers and my parents will sign papers. She made a deep impression on you. God, she was so smart. She said, when I was a little girl, she said, the worst day of my of my life every year was the day before school started. She said, I start thinking, what if I get a teacher that's like my old stepdad? Or like, what if I can't make friends? She said, sometimes I have a little bit of a hard time making friends. And she said, I'd, I'd be up, awake almost all night long. I'd get up in the morning and I'd get, you know, I'd go to school and I walk into that room. She said, I look around the room and she said, I knew every other kid in there that had secrets and they knew me. She said, you don't tell your secrets. She said, if the teacher reads you a story and some of those secrets are in there, it just makes you feel better. It makes you feel like you're not alone. Hmm. So if you stuck my story in a book and some kid picked it up and read it and it worked, look what we did. And I, I was about seven or eight chapters into Whale Talk. And I thought, God, if I put this kid in this book, it's going to be better than it ever had a right to be because I don't have the imagination for this. And I had to go back and because I, I needed to put her in way, way earlier. I had to go back and do quite a bit of editing. And she's not the main character, but she's, she's, she has a lot to do with everything that happens in that story. And I remember when I, got, when I, I finished the book, and it was it was it was a real satisfying writing experience. The main character in it was a mixed race kid already, so I mean it, it it really fit in well. And I thought, you know, you always like it if you know the trade magazines like this and the teachers like it and librarians because that's how it gets into schools and libraries. But I want her to like it. And I get lucky one more time because she, I think I think it was between her it might have been between her sophomore and junior year, but maybe or freshman and sophomore year in in college, she came back home and. She called me up and she said, you did it, you did it, you stuck me in a book. And I said, yeah, what'd you think? And she was mad at me because I wouldn't use the real names of all the jerks in her life. And I said, yeah, well, they didn't sign papers. <laughs> how does being privy to the kind of stories like the one that you just told shape how you approach writing the kind of books that you write? You know, I walked away, I walked away think, thinking that this really is what fiction is about for me. The gift that she gave me when she you know, handed over her life, I thought, you know, I, I've been banned. Every book I've, I've written has been banned someplace. Or, and they get challenged a lot. But I, I thought, you know, the censors are always saying to tone down the language or don't talk about, you know, things as tough as they are, or, you know, whatever the issue is. And I thought, you know, I could tone down the language on this one. But I said, if I tone down the language on this one, I, I tone down the meanness of that stepdad. And if I tone down the meanness of the stepdad, I tone down the heroism of the kid. That seemed like a sin. You know, it's like, you don't, you, you just don't screw up a gift like that. You brought up censors, Chris. Beginning with your first book, Running Loose, your novels and your short stories have been subject to challenges. Oh, yeah. And you've said that you faced a choice earlier in your career, bend and appease your critics or write the kind of stories that you aspired to tell as a writer. And obviously chose the latter. And years later, your books continue to draw challenges in schools and libraries. What is it about your stories, do you think, that makes some adults so uncomfortable? You know, it's funny. I think they very often cite language, but that usually, if you ever get into a conversation with them, that's kind of a mask. Um, so it's, it's real easy to say, you know, there's this many words or this many N words or there's this many whatever. But when you get into the, when you get into talking with about it or going to a school board meeting and, you know, the, and the issues come up, a whole lot of it has to do with, you know, you put a gay character in a story and it's, it's gotten way better now. But for a long time, boy, that was, that was, that was death to a story. And didn't even matter that it didn't have anything to do. The kid was just a gay kid, you know, like 10% of kids are. But it was, it was like if you put that kid in there and he wasn't a serial killer or something, um, you were uh, recruiting. And... Anytime there's a discussion about sex, anytime there was a discussion about uh, faith or religion or spirituality or anything like that, if it didn't fit in with, you know, the, and it was mostly the political and Christian right that went after those books. And 
it never bothered me because number one, that's a real easy, just from, from a debate point of view, it's a real easy argument to have, you know, if you, number one, if you think you're right, you always win. And, and the struggle that I was having with those people was that so many of the kids that I worked with, whether they were abuse kids and then, and later just, you know, teenage kids that were just in trouble, suicidal kids and all that, it was almost always in, in response to some kind of a power struggle where somebody was going to tell them how to act before they could learn through experience, you know, what was, what felt right and what didn't feel right, all that kind of thing. And so it was, it was about, it was this idea that you can control what kids think by not, you know, by holding, holding information out. And number one, you can't do that. I mean, you're not, unless you're homeschooling your kid and being with him every minute, you know, you're not going to, you can't do that. But it turned out that it was a lot about issues and it was a lot about, uh, you know, that kind of thing. More recently, and this has turned into a real, a real crazy thing in the, in the, particularly in YA literature, the politically correct left has gotten almost as uh, censor crazy as the right. Now they don't, they very seldom call for a book to be banned, but if they think you're portraying, if one of your characters portrays any kind of stereotype, they'll go on Twitter and just take you apart and they'll go on book reads. And that's more problematic because a lot of those people, a lot of those people have the same you know, life philosophy that I have. But, you know, like I said, my dad was a, my dad was a bomber pilot. He bombed the guy that was the, one of the greatest censors ever. <laughs> and uh, well, he told me, you know, over and over and over again, if you can't stand up for the thing you hate, then you can't stand up for free speech. Take away hate speech. Take away, you know, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater, as they used to say. But um, free speech is free speech. It's not easy. And I, I kind of stand by my, I stand by my old stances. Any story that brings out conversation is a story that, you know, is one that needs to be talked about. I I had a situation not too long ago where this junior high kid in just outside of Chicago, up in DeKalb, he wrote me, he'd read Running Loose, and he didn't. He wasn't much of a reader, he was a real good athlete, wrote me and said, I see you have a little problem with the, and he just used the N-word. And so, so I wrote him back and I said, you know, I said, I'm really glad you, you, you wrote that. I said, if you read that, number one, I'm not, I'm not as a writer having a problem with that word. I'm I'm giving that word to racists that I grew up with. And if I'm going to talk about how insensitive and how and how hateful a racist can be, I have to use hateful language. Now that that word is as hateful as any word there is in our language. And I was growing up, when I was growing up in Cascade, Idaho, I'll bet you I didn't see an African-American person in, in, in the flesh until I was probably 11 years old. But I heard the N-word every day. So we have this, we go back and forth and have this conversation. And then his mom, who is a lawyer, gets a hold of me and says, this is the best thing that ever happened to him. Is there any way we can get you to come here? And I said, yeah, if you do it, I'll come there for nothing. And their school cleared out an entire day so that we could have that conversation. And at that point, you know, you just when that happens and you see when you see these other people step up and they see it from the they see it from all these different places. You think, boy, all I have to do is show up. The the real good conversation is going to come from somebody besides me. All I got to do is be there. Last year, in 2018, you published your 15th book, Loser's Bracket, which I suspect is going to make some adults uncomfortable as well. Would you mind sharing a synopsis of the story for people who are listening and haven't read that book? Yeah, it's it's actually my first story uh, with a female narrator. And it's kind of based on a kid that I knew who was, who was um, I knew about her after I was a therapist. But she was a kid that grew up in foster care. And she was lucky in the sense that she had um, the same, if, if she worked her way back when her parents fooled the state enough to make, make them think that they were not doing drugs anymore and that they were going to take care of their kids, she'd go back in, into the home and then they'd screw up and she'd go back. But the same foster family kept taking her. So she, she didn't get bounced around through the system. 
And then it got to the place where the state was pretty clear that they were going to have to terminate parental rights. But the struggle this girl had, and, then, and there's a place in the book where she says, if I got the family I need, but I didn't get the one I want. And this was something that I saw over and over and over again as a therapist. You'd see these kids and, you know, coming out of really, really dysfunctional places. I mean, places that were dangerous and places that were going to absolutely end them up, you know, in really unproductive situations as they got older and older. But that kind of struggle to get back to biological parents, if they could, was really a powerful thing. I heard, I heard one little kid a long time ago, one little kid was talking about his sister. He wanted to go back home, and they had a really, really violent dad. He wanted to go back home. The little girl didn't want to go back home, and she had been severely physically injured. And he was just matter-of-factly, he said, I don't know why she doesn't want to go back home. He didn't kill her. And I thought... You know, that's the that's the level of pull that some of these kids feel. Some don't, but the ones that do, it's they live straddled. So the character in, in the loser bracket is um, she's that kid, and she's she's in a home that takes care of her. They got money. She's a jock, and and they they make sure that she has all the stuff she needs to play every sport and all of that. She's going to go to college, all of it. And then this crazy crazy family on the outside is, you know, faking it and trying to get them back. And they can't do that anymore. And the foster parents don't like them very much. So when she sees them, it has to be in public someplace. And so she plays sports. And when she plays sports, they get, you know, they can come. And they don't, you know, anywhere near enough, but they come just enough. So she just keeps doing it. And the loser's bracket title comes from, we have a we have a street three-on-three -three basketball tournament here in Spokane. That is the largest one in the country. They're like something like 11 or 12,000 kids and adults playing basketball. The whole downtown closes and it's just courts, half courts. And you can win your, you can win, you can win by winning all your games, but you can also win your, your class by losing the first game and then coming back up through the loser's bracket. Well, if you come back up through the loser's bracket, you have to play about twice as many games. And so she's play, she always loses the first game. And her, the kids she plays with are pissed about it. They get mad at her. They say, just this one time, let us win the first game. And she'll say, okay, and then not. Because she has more chances to have these parents come. And they don't. You know, I mean, it, they're bad parents for a reason. There's a moment in Loser's Bracket when one of the characters tells Annie, the protagonist, it isn't a question of whether you're the hero of your life. It's whether or not you're the narrator. Can you talk about what you understand that to mean? God, yeah. Well, one of the things I did, I, I put her in a book club and it kind of a, it's a reading club, but they do some writing too. And for me, that's such a, it's, it's such a great place to tell a story because you can talk about story while you're telling stories. And the one thing that kids tend to feel, oh, and God, this isn't just foster kids, you know, it's part of adolescence. The one thing you, that you feel is that you're, you're trying to get control of your life. And it seems like you can't because there are all these other people who know better than you know. You know, your parents are there, your teachers are there, all these adults. And I don't know why this culture does this. It was, it was true when I was growing up. It's true now. And you hear teachers say this, your parents say this. I mean, anybody who's in, you know, anybody who's trying to help, you know, I want to help you not make the mistakes I made. Well, I'm sitting back there going, they're not going to make the mistakes you made. They're going to make the mistakes they made. And they aren't the same ones. You know, they might look like the same ones, but my experience is my experience. If kids get in this place where they feel like they have to please people, and the minute you feel like you have to please these people that you really care about, but they don't really know your interior, you automatically turn yourself into a liar because you, you want things to look one way, but they really are another way. And so there, there, there's this discussion in this, in this group about what is a real hero, and there's, there, there are a whole bunch of different perspectives about it. And one, one person in there says over and over, there's no such thing as a hero. There are only heroic acts because everybody, everybody has that things in their life that they're totally ashamed of. And, and so it, it comes down to when, and what, this line that you're talking about, it comes down to maybe that's what we shouldn't be talking about. Maybe, maybe this idea about heroes is mostly our imagination and our, our perspective on something. And the question is, if you really want to be, if you really want to be the person that moves your life, you got to be the narrator. You got to be the person who tells your own story. And if you're going to tell your own story, you're, that means you're the person who's going to have to make it happen. 
And, you know, I look back at all the, at the kids that I worked with in the alternative school. I look back at anybody that I've ever been involved with who was looking to me for help or anybody who, that I was looking to for help. And the thing I came away with is if somebody comes into my sphere of influence and they walk away feeling a little more empowered than they did when they came in, that was a success. And when I go looking for help, if I come away feeling some power that I, that I have, that I can influence, that I can influence what happens next, then I'm going to, I'm going to be fine. I talked with Matt De La Pena on this podcast a few months ago, and he said I love that guy. God, I love that guy. He's, he's fantastic. He said something that's just been rattling around in my brain ever since. He described writing for young adults as a form of advocacy. Absolutely. Do you understand yourself to advocate for young people through your writing? Yeah, I do. I, in fact, it's it's kind of the only thing I can do. It's it's like I was working with some kids down in, uh, and it was actually one of those towns that had had a, a, a few years before it had a shooting. So there was, you know, there's a lot of intensity, story intensity around that kind of thing. But anyway, I remember we got toward the end of the end of the thing. It was a really good discussion. And we got toward the end of the thing. And one kid raised his hand, we had one last question. And he said, okay, if you could give us one piece of advice, what would you say? And I said, well, one I'm going to say, you got to give me two. The one I'm going to say is stay alive. Do whatever you have to do to stay alive. But I said, the one piece of advice I'll give you is don't listen to me. Because I can come in here and tell you that I'm an old guy. I know all the mistakes you can make. I can show you how not to make them, da-da-da-da-da. And all you're going to hear is blah, 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 blah. But what I want you to do is listen to yourself and find out what you need. Talk to your friends. You know, I mean, try to figure out what makes you feel powerful in a way that doesn't hurt anybody else. I don't know what that is for you. You know, I have no idea. I know what it is for me, but I had to find it out. And my responses to your questions and my stories or emails or things like that are always going to be, tell me about you. And if you want to, if you want some of my autobiograph- autobiographical stuff, I'll, I'll give it to you. But I'm never going to say that I, you, I don't want you to make the mistakes I made. You're not going to. You live in a different time. And what I can do is say, I look at your age and I think this is a culture that is terrified of you. They would freeze dry you till you're 27. But if you don't get to go through this time and, and figure out what decency feels like, what it feels like to get something that you really need, what it feels like to give something that you really want to give or that somebody else really needs, if you don't figure that out, you're going to have a shitty adulthood. So if I'm writing stories that you like, it's because my character did something that resonates with you. Otherwise, you're going to close it and go get a book by Matt Delvania. <laughs> Chris, man, thank you so much for coming on this show. I have so much respect for the work that you're doing as an advocate for young people. Oh, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. And with that, we've reached the end of another episode of the Storyteller's Thread. If you liked what you heard, please tell a friend about the show. I'm looking forward to seeing you back here next month when we'll continue to talk about the craft of storytelling. Till then, happy reading.